Hi, uh, I'm Dr. Ashley Ross. Um, I'm a u urologist and urologic oncologist at Northwestern Medicine. My speciality is the prostate and prostatic diseases, and in particular, prostate cancer. In terms of genetics and prostate cancer, I think we can think about it in a couple ways. One is, um, why is prostate cancer um, heritable? Why do men get prostate cancer? In terms of um, having any type of prostate cancer, there's been studies that show that some genes, the most, the most uh, uh, important of which is probably HOXB13, um, can lead to the development of prostate cancer in terms of any type of prostate cancer. Uh, that's a homeobox gene that is known in patterning of the hindgut, and men with allelic variants in that gene can have a more, are more likely to develop any prostate cancer during their lifetime. In terms of aggressive or lethal prostate cancer, um, that's where we've had some more recent discoveries that um, mutations in DNA break repair genes, particularly BRCA2, um, seem to really drive a lethal prostate cancer. So for example, if we look at metastatic men, about 10 to 15% of them will have germline mutations in DNA break repair mediated genes like BRCA1, BRCA2, ATM. The most important gene in that group is BRCA2. And if we look at the somatic genetics, uh, meaning the genetics of their tumor, so their inherited genetics and what's happened in the tumor, the frequency of, of mutation in those genes becomes even higher. With recognition that um, there's certain genetic drivers of particularly lethal disease, the National Comprehensive uh, Cancer Network has um, upped their um, recommendations of who should be screened um, for germline mutations. Um, so for any man with, with metastatic prostate cancer and for any man with high risk disease, meaning like a high grade prostate cancer, for instance, these men should be considering germline genetic testing. And which we're, what we're looking for is again, um, these DNA break repair machinery uh, mutations. So BRCA1, BRCA2, ATM, and, and to some extent also uh, genes involved in Lynch, in Lynch syndrome, mismatch repair genes. So if we take that category and we expand it, we say, well, how about for all men diagnosed with prostate cancer, even men with lower risk categories, men with low risk disease, all the way up to, into intermediate risk disease of clinically localized prostate cancer. And there, the recommendations are if there's a family history that they can, can consider genetic testing. Family history would be uh, one first degree relative with prostate cancer diagnosed before the age of 60, uh, or two relatives um, with a history of breast, ovarian, or pancreatic cancer. There you're thinking about BRCA2 in particular, um, or two relatives with a history of colorectal cancer, gastric, uterine, uh, urothelial cancer. And there you're thinking about Lynch syndrome genes, like um, mismatch repair genes. In terms of genomic tests and how genomic tests might aid in treatment selection, it's important to uh, note that genomic tests encompass more than just looking at uh, the DNA inheritable um, risks, so more than just genetics, but now also expression levels. Um, and what's going on in the RNA. So there are multiple genomic tests on the market for prostate cancer, both um, localized and somewhat emerging in the metastatic space. There's genomic tests that look at prognostic risk that can help us decide if a man should have therapy or not, if the therapy should be intensified. Um, there's also ones that look at treatment response. Some of the genomic factors and genomic risk scores have been developed at Northwestern. Uh, there's one signature developed with Dr. Uh, Ted Schaefer and others that looks at a antigen low signature. And men with that antigen low signature at expression levels might be more responsive also to PARP inhibitors. And there's a clinical trial that's soon to be activated here looking at that question. And the idea is we have the men with germline deficiencies or somatic deficiencies that we've seen are responsive to things like PARP inhibitors, and that makes one cluster. And then there's maybe a larger cluster if we look at people who maybe do not have mutations uh, in their DNA, but have expression patterns that represent those same mutations. And that's where some of the genomic tests can come into play in the more advanced disease states.